You're listening to Ingenuity, the podcast that dives into the wonderful world of everything industrial. From the birth of the first combustion engine to breakthrough hybrid power technologies, Ingenuity examines just about everything the industry has to offer. The podcast provides a platform for industry leaders, engineers, scientists, and small business owners to educate listeners about past, present, and future industries across the planet. Hey everyone, um, this is an episode that we recorded at Con Expo 2023 uh, with JCB. Uh, it's our first episode going into 2023 after a little bit of a hiatus over the winter break. Um, was very excited to meet with JCB, get some hands on that hydrogen engine and some of their um, some of their other press um, presentations on on the engine. But the, the important to note that you know the focus of this interview was really about the specific engine technology and the development that JCB had been doing. I also think there's lots of other topics here about where hydrogen is coming from, what the cost is, how you transport it, how you work with it safely, all that kind of stuff there. So there's there's tons of those questions around hydrogen that I want to get to and maybe explore this season, but this episode is really focused on the engine and engine technology. Um, so uh, here's a Tim Bernhope and Tom Beamish with JCB to help us understand the hydrogen engine. Today I'm happy to be to be joined by Tim Bernhope, the Chief Innovation and Growth Officer with JCB. So we're here to talk about um, JCB's internal combustion hydrogen engine that uh, you pulled the covers off of here at Con Expo and let everyone poke and prod for the first time. Um, Tim, can you just give us a minute to introduce yourself and your background and your role with JCB? Yep, so Tim Bernhope, Chief Innovation Officer. Um, worked in many areas of the business for JCB, um, engineering product, um, running businesses, backhaul, load all, uh, ran sales for the world for a while, and then for the last decade or so, been working to uh, to transform the product range with our engineering team, and uh, more recently looking at the off road to zero, electric solutions and hydrogen solutions. So I'm Tom Beamish, I'm a principal engineer uh, working on our innovation team on Net Zero. Excellent. Uh, I I think you have one of the uh, most intriguing job titles I think I've ever heard. Of. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the uh, you know, JCB has been on uh, a path of development, starting with the engine about 20 years ago, um, and really never slowing down the progress. And um, the newest, the newest unveiling of this IC engine um, is really a, a huge step forward. But I want to I want to back up just a little bit and talk about um, what was what was JCB's goals with your an original internal development uh, internal combustion engine program with the diesel program. And how that kind of informs where you're at today with the hydrogen engine. Well, I think what we um, what we what we did it was our founder, Mr. Mr. JCB Joseph Cyril Bamford. He had a real desire for us to do our own engine, mm -hmm. and for years he developed hydraulic cylinders that we manufacture for our products. He developed transmissions. He developed axles, but really wanted to do uh, engines. And I think sometimes we forget. You see the machine. But actually, the real competitive advantage is to have the powertrain. Yeah. So the powertrain really makes the best machine, makes it the most efficient, gives you the most torque, gives you the... Uh... So Mr. Bamford had this real desire to build a JCB engine. I think up till sort of the late 90s, we didn't really have a volume to justify. Um, but all of a sudden, as we started to, to get into tens of thousands of machines, really, we, uh, we decided we should, we should go into... Uh, uh, engine design and it was probably at the time where a lot of manufacturers were stopping doing engines and buying third-party engines but we um, we had a real passion and we we knew the next 20 years would be difficult mm -hmm. in terms of the emission stages we had to go through and what we wanted to ensure was that we had um, the most powerful by torque engine we had the most fuel efficient engine and we had systems that were the most suited in terms of after treatment etc for our customers for our own market. So you guys came into the market at a really interesting time in which you knew you had tier four final ahead of you. Um, so designing that engine from the ground up with efficiency and clean emissions was one of the, I'm assuming one of the top partners in the, in the engine design, right? Yeah. Um, and, and you still have, you still have some of the most efficient and some of the most, uh, I'd say least burdensome after treatment systems um, of all of your competition in that horsepower range today. Was the hydrogen engine in mind 20 years ago, or was that on the drawing board, or is that, has it really just evolved from the diesel? Well, I think it's, um, 
it's really well it, it, it it's kind of evolved less from the diesel and more from the working on electric and working on fuel cell solutions yeah so i think we like like everyone we you know over 20 years we've created the most fabulous diesel engine you know it's the most efficient it's the cleanest um, you know we've reduced particulates and uh the tailpipe emissions by what 97 98 percent you know it is today's yeah. solution is is quite quite incredible and um and sadly we have to move on so fossil fuels are not the future most people in the world forget about banning fossil fuels and talk about banning engines which is completely the wrong thing to do it's not the poor piece of metal's fault yep so let's get rid of fossil fuels so we started to look at battery solutions they're great for small products that do a couple of hundred hours a year and don't consume much fuel but as you start to work your way through the equipment start to increase the number of hours the, and the, the hours worked so take a machine that you want to double shift work 24 hours a day you know you haven't got much charge charge time left if you if you use a machine for two hours on electric you've got 22 hours left to charge so we started to look at a mobile fuel which led us to hydrogen and then we looked at fuel cells we had a few challenges so that really got us to go back and look at hydrogen in a, in a combustion engine. So th that's an interesting path to me because I think listening to a lot of people's road to zero, path to zero presentations, um, the hydrogen fuel cell is really seems to be kind of like the end of the road for a lot of those technology paths. And that, you know, that that seems to be the most mature or accepted probably mature technology for a lot of those, a lot of those away from infrastructure, high duty cycle mm. applications. Um, so it's interesting to me that you started there and then came back to the IC engine. Um, the Can you talk a little bit about what the main factors were that decided that, that forced or caused you to go back and look at the engine as opposed to continuing to mature the, the fuel cell solution? Well, I think, I think, I think the great thing about our chairman, Lord Bamford, you know, we, we're a family business. And he really drives us to look at innovative techniques. But what he, what he does every day is to get us in, to go out and learn. And, and by having seven electric machines in the market, we learned what was good and what was bad. Customers really wanted mobile fuel. You know, you, when most of our equipment, I think 97% of it today, construction equipment, we take the fuel to the machines every day while the machines keep working. Yeah. And, and they, they keep working for a reason because our contractors make money when they're working. You know, they don't make money when they're being charged. And that, that was the lesson from us. Contractors said to us, you know, you engineers can get into the different technologies, but, but make sure we can do what we do when, when you've finished all this. Uh -huh. and, I, and I think sometimes we can forget that. Um, so we got into the fuel cell side and we were a bit surprised. And I think we like the engineers can be a bit naive because we read all these things on the internet and we, we trusted people that were experts. But when we actually phoned them up and said, well, how, how did you experience that? Or how did you, they've never ever done a, a battery electric machine in their lives and they've never ever done, certainly done a fuel cell machine. Yeah. So there are actually very few people in our industry that I think have got a, a fuel cell machine running. And yeah, when, in a when, heavy duty piece of equipment, yeah, there's plenty of them on buses and yeah, things like yeah. that, right? And I think the big difference is for me is transient response. So, you know, a big, a big digger needs energy quickly. Mm -hmm. So you think of you, the excavator, you lift up, you're on low load, you go into the dig, you, you got a full power, you're driving back. It's not like a bus that gradually goes around a city that right. gently rises. Um, same with a truck. It's a very controlled, you don't necessarily need that torque, all of that power. And that, that's really where we're different. I often compare, you can look at a truck. And it, it's fairly gentle in its movement and it does in England, it does 56 miles an hour constantly. And yeah. you, you look at a train, we're a bit like the train train goes into a station and then it's got a set off with 10 carriages or 50 trucks full of, full of stone that goes from zero to full load to full speed. And, and maybe over a, a half day journey, it might do it three or four times, yeah. stopping at stations. We do that every 27 seconds on an excavator. <laughs> And, and having that ability to produce that engine, that's why flywheels and engines are, are being perfect. So, so when you look at a fuel cell, and I always, um, I always go back and I, you know, we, we're lucky we run two Toyota Mirai cars, one of the first ones that was produced in 15 and one of the latest. But there's a video on YouTube that shows how that works. And, and essentially it starts on a power battery, 
depletes its energy, the fuel cell slowly warms up, it recharges the battery and powers. Yeah. And, and people forget it's pretty much an electric solution and you are using the fuel cell to either recharge or to power. And when, when you drive around in the Toyota, I mean, I love watching the screen and seeing what, what's happening. And mm -hmm. But actually, the people think the fuel cell is just the primary source and that's it. Um, but it, but it's not. You're managing that chemical reaction, and it's it, it's very very complicated electronics. Yeah. Well, I, so I'd like to dive into the combustion strategy on the engine a little bit because it seems that that's where all the magic is in the combustion mm -hmm. of hydrogen, and where most of the past efforts have have stumbled and failed. Um, so this engine is a lean burn combustion, right? Um, what can you talk about the? Uh, um, the decision to go for a lean burn strategy versus a stoichiometric burn or something else and what you learned from what you guys found in the market or from past studies that led you to that lean burn strategy well, i think i think the um i mean what, one of the things one of the things i think we all struggled with was was we're obsessed with diesel engines <laughs> and, and, and it was interesting somebody actually said to me one day i don't think this project will be successful unless you stop stop talking about comparisons to diesel engines and I, and I sort of said well, what, what do you mean and I said well and he said well it's a hydrogen engine and, and from that point on we all we all changed so yeah. so what what I've been looking at as well what pressure we, do we run at diesel what temperature do we run? what pressure should therefore we run and actually yeah. it was the day that we said actually forget the other two we start from a clean sheet of paper first principles design how should we combust hydrogen and and you start to get into it that lots and lots of air very little hydrogen okay how do you how do you what size of flame do you need so therefore what you know what what's the magnitude of your ignition uh, what spark do you need how do you mix the hydrogen yeah. and actually when you when you put all of the diesel on one side and go back and just think hydrogen how how do i perfect hydrogen all so, of a sudden it's, it's completely different so is that lean burn optimized for efficiency or for power output or or i mean I'm, I'm sure it's an array of factors but what's what's the primary driver toward lean burn um feel free to chip in tom uh, i think all of them yeah it is all so that's, so that's just where all the, your your design points kind of converge or at least that's the best case scenario yeah well what i mean what you what you do want is to be i mean from the offset we want to we want to be efficient yeah so we want to use the least amount of hydrogen we got we want to maximize the air and what we're actually doing is, is pushing a huge amount of air in to, to help us maybe get some more power through that process. Um, we've also got to mix it. You know, I think I think some of our research on early hydrogen, hydrogen engines was about using very large capacity engines, no turbocharging systems. And, and the problem was you had the capacity, but you, you, weren't, you weren't driving the power and the efficiency. So history would tell you based on, on experiments of the past, the 76 that we sort of presented was that fundamentally the choice was wrong. You know, what, one of the great things over the last 20 years is, is we've been able to use small capacity engines with turbocharging systems, yeah. and we, we get a lot more power in a much smaller capacity. Tom's going to draw his great graph here <laughs> just to help us out. We might have to, we might have to post a, a copy of the show notes, right? So it's all about the flammability. So you can do things with hydrogen that you just can't do with diesel. So with diesel, you have to operate with kind of a stoichiometric, right? Because you need a high temperature for combustion because we're using spark ignition to actually, and, and because hydrogen is so flammable, you can use a lot more air, which means you get a lot cooler combustion. Mm -hmm. So actually you get a lot, much cleaner burn where with, with diesel, you're constantly, haven't got any access on this. So, so that, that's, that, that's basically that's going so this is this is rich uh so we're, we're gonna cut in a little bit at this point here because uh, i recognize that uh, audio of somebody drawing a graph on paper is probably not the best way to explain it to a um an audience over a podcast so uh the graph that that we're looking at here at this point is a graph with an x-axis um of our our fuel ratio right we have uh lean burn on the left and rich burn on the right and then there's there's multiple different graphs on the y-axis. So we have um, the NOx emissions, the combustion temperature, mechanical efficiency. So we're looking at 
the the supposed relationship of those three factors as you change your fuel equivalence ratio. Um, and the the traditional knowledge, the information from the studies that JCB had garnered was that as we move lean, so as you move left on the graph, um, the, the combustion temperature drops, the NOx emissions uh, drop quite substantially, almost to zero as you come left. And the traditional knowledge of, of hydrogen was that that mechanical efficiency also dropped, um, cutting in half like from the stoichiometric or, or 1.0 equivalence ratio down to almost you know, a, a two to one air to fuel ratio. And, um, and so what they're trying to explain here is that what they found with their turbocharging strategy was that they can drop the combustion temperature, they can drop the NOx emissions, but with turbocharging, they can keep their mechanical efficiency much higher than was traditionally thought. So we're going to have a link to this graph and to the scientific paper in the show notes. Um, this would be a good time to go take a look at that so that you can kind of see what those relationships look like. So so this, this principle of is these, these are potentially diesel, mm. gasoline, petrol. And what, what, what you start to understand is you can bring, you can bring down the temperature and you can bring down and you can start to use hydrogen way down here. So the, the, the other revelation from the presentation last night to me was, um, I, I think a lot of people, at least initially were thinking hydrogen, all you get out of the tailpipe is water. Um, and then a lot of people went, well, okay, you're probably gonna have NOx there as well, right? But the the low temperature combustion strategy, um, I don't necessarily want to say it eliminates NOx, so, but so but so the interesting thing is this this graph here is Tom. What is it? Yeah, so you've got so you've got temperature, but temperature is directly linked to NOx. Right. So um, people often say it's about thirteen hundred degrees Celsius that you start to produce NOx. It's actually a bit more of a spectrum, mm -hmm. but if you can get below that temperature, so you, and that's rich spots basically. So you want to have a really good mixture, so it's really uniform. Uh, to then get into that so, lean so, burn. So you're going to have temperature on here, you're going to also have NOx. As Tom said, they're fairly... But what... They're what, what, so as, this, yeah. as this heads down to zero, so having a very, very lean mixture and a very low temperature gives you, effectively, no NOx. Yeah, I think that... Um, if, if you ever want to look at a paper, there's a, there's a, a professor in York, in the UK, called Alistair, Alistair Lewis. Alistair Lewis. Lewis. So, so it's, it's well worth having a look at, to look at it independently. But, but he, he, his graph says that if... So we, we read a paper and he said, if somebody in the world of hydrogen combustion could do this, you would have absolutely clean tailpipe emissions. Yeah. What, what he failed was, he also had an efficiency graph. Yeah. And what he showed on his graph, which you'll see, he said, your engine, you, you can get a very clean tailpipe emission, but your engine will be very inefficient. Yeah. Now, that was based on high capacity engines. And what we've done is using... Increase, we've, increase we've, the... We've, the we've, 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 we've absolutely managed to in maintain our efficiency line. In fact, we're probably about a percent and a half up. That's impressive. I, I think that speaks to having to throw away the diesel mentality to start the project, yeah. right? Because so, everyone's been going to higher pressure, higher temperature. So, so, more efficient. so what, what happened is, I think, I think Ryan talked about 76 papers. So we looked at 76 experiments by car companies, universities, and what they'd all done is, they'd all put hydrogen into, into a gasoline, yeah. gasoline engine, and as a consequence, that there were all conversions. And, and going back to what somebody said to me is, if you're thinking about diesel, you're thinking about a conversion. Yeah. You've got to go back and create hydrogen first principles. Yeah. And that's really, and it's taken us, you know, when Ryan said 150, 160 iterations of detailed analysis, that's what we've done. 160 detailed analysis to allow us to understand which part of the curve we can get to. And of course, my job, being the pain at the top, is I want perfection. So I want clean tailpipe and I want maximum efficiency. Yeah. <laughs> Just keep pushing, right? Yeah, keep pushing. Um, so what what kind of compression ratios are you running on the hydrogen? And I haven't been able to find that anywhere. If that's something you can speak yeah, to. Yeah, we, we we don't give it away. Um, all we can probably say is Did you give us a comparison to the diesel? Well, diesel's was? diesel's high, so yeah. diesels will be up to twenty, around twenty, maybe a bit above, a bit below. Uh, petrol is what eleven, twelve, yeah. something like ten. We we may be a little bit in between. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Not asking for any industry <laughs> secrets, but it's an it's an important question. <laughs> This is where John keeps kicking me over the table. Um, 
and the and the injection strategy is a is a port injection strategy, right? Mm -hmm. It's not directly the cylinder. Is that the port injection chosen for the mixing to get the mixing right with the air and hydrogen? Yeah. Um, so so again, going going back to there are as you go through different sizes, different capacities, that that whole that whole choice of whether it's port or direct, yeah, is, is based really on your ability of how much fuel you want and then how much air you need. Yeah. And again, we um, there is a cutoff point, isn't there? But yeah. It's also about having low pressure going into the cylinder, uh, so we don't need high pressure gas. So even though the gas is at three fifty bar in the tank, mm -hmm. it's actually going into the engine at much lower pressure. What can can you say what that injection pressure is? Probably less than twenty. Clock okay. delivery delivery of gas. Twenty bar. Yeah. Less than twenty yeah. bar. Yeah. Okay. So actually, when people think about high pressure hydrogen machine. It's actually only within the tank. Right. Yeah. Then it's immediately got, regulated. Then you've got to regulate it. Actually, right. the, it's a low pressure. It's low yeah, pressure I mean, to the machine. In that respect, it's not a lot different than CNG or LNG installations that have yeah. a high pressure tank and a low pressure. Mm. Okay. Okay. Um, so the, the other key here is the turbocharger arrangement. Yeah. Um, looking at the engine outside, you don't have a massive turbocharger on the engine, um, but I take it you're delivering quite a lot of air. What? What changes were required, or is there anything unique about that turbocharging system? No, I mean, I mean we, we're lucky today, so this is a 55 kilowatt engine, but we've got engines going up to, what, close on 200 mm -hmm. uh, kilowatts. So we have, for example, agricultural loadholds. We run at, what, 129, maybe a little bit, bit above kilowatts. And we've already got big turbo systems on right. So a lot of the turbos we, we're already using at that size, but on bigger engines, or bigger capacity engines. Yep. Um, so what we've really done is fine tuned them to suit, but but basically we're we're just after an airflow. We're just after an increased airflow. You just need a certain amount of flow. Yeah. So this is a, a fixed geometry electronic waste gate, or is it a, a variable? Charge. Variable. It's variable yeah. Okay. Okay. So when we first started looking at the the turbocharger, we, we went for a really big one. I think we need lots of air, so yeah. we need a big turbocharger. Yeah. Actually, we've done the other way now and got to a smaller one, like the one you see on the stand, and it's high performance, so it's high power, and basically it spins up much faster. Yep. That means you get a good transient response. So it's just all this learning that, you know, that we're kind of developing, that you, you think you're going to go one way with development, actually you end up going back to the opposite yeah. way. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the intuition would have been, why is it not a great big giant turbocharger on there if you really need to lean? I think it's all, it's all about, again, the learning is all about passage of air through your whole engine. Mm -hmm. and it, it, it's interesting about how you flow that through at the right time using the right uh, so that that ability to put it in quickly rather than excessively yeah is, is quite important for throughput okay all right um i want to we talked a little bit about power and torque comparison to diesel but the first engine developed is a is a 55 kilowatt 74 horsepower um 4.8 liter engine is it, can you talk about the commonality between this iteration of the hydrogen engine and your, your 4.8 liter diesel? What, how much commonality is there between the two? And, and maybe what are some of the important differences besides obviously think, the top I, end? I, yeah, I think, I think the, the huge difference is, is the top end. So even though the top end has similar design principles, we, um, we've obviously got a, um, a mixing rail for the, for the port going in. We've got, um, Yeah, you could argue it's similar architecture. They, it, it's based on the detail of each individual component. So to get a different compression ratio, to learn how to mix air. Yeah. So whether you swirl or whether you tumble or whether you swumble, as you want, you've got to mix. Swumble. You've got to mix the hydrogen. Yeah. So Formula One will tumble air. Yeah. Diesel would swirl it. Yeah. What we've come up with is probably a mixture of the two, because what we have to do is to mix the hydrogen gas that's very light. So the hydrogen gas wants to go at the top of the cylinder yep. as fast as it can. We put in, we've got what, 17 milliseconds to get a perfect mix to allow it. So we, we've got to use this very, and again, a lot of that detailed analysis is understanding that hydrogen and air mix to give you the perfect, the perfect combustion. You don't want patches where you get hot spots or, right. you, you know, potential of, of other events. So we've really perfected that through this, um, through this analysis. So have you had, have you had to battle through pre-ignition knock type issues that are common on other spark um, engines? I think, I think we, because we, we would put that as a potential risk. We didn't, we didn't fight it. We, we prepared for it. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah. 
I mean, it's kind of easy to see how many I suppose, but um, the I know we talked a little bit last night, but the the plans for higher power nodes, um, the is is fifty five kilowatt all of it you can get out of the four point eight liter engine, um, or no, I think, have I, think a, I think what we what we worked on first was our so we 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 look at. Um, so if you think about the engine, we have a, a huge range of GSM engine, different ratings. Yep. This, this particular one covers probably 65, 70% of our volume. Yeah. Right. So we started with a one that has the most diverse portfolio. So what we wanted to make sure it could do, in, it could do backhoes in Europe and in India, and also sort of the construction telehandler, it's in the side dumpers. So it's probably the most diverse. So what we wanted to make sure was we designed the engine with the appropriate torque, with the appropriate efficiency for a multitude of products. But of course, from that learning, we could just work our way up through the, through the range. So that, trying to, trying to figure out how to press you into a yes or no answer here, but is, that, is there more power to be had out of the 4.8 liter engine on hydrogen, or do you need additional displacement to get to those? There's, there's a huge opportunity to get more power. Okay, all right. Fair enough. Um, in terms of efficiency, can you, can you compare the, the total efficiency to diesel? I mean, we're, we're still internal combustion, we're still spark ignite, so I've got to imagine we're in the same range of overall efficiency as a, as a diesel engine, right? In the mid-40s, low-40s types of efficiencies? Yeah, so we, um, we, we're around that low-40s in, in, uh, in diesel, and I, and I think what, what, what surprised us is, so we, we look at every aspect of the, what I call the curve, you know, the engine, the engine map, and interestingly, we are, at where we work, most of our time as a product, we're getting about one and a half, almost two percent of efficiency gain using hydrogen. Yeah, which really surprised us. Really, I'd like to say it was planned. It was, it was planned. It was perfected. A happy surprise. But, but, yeah. but actually, in the in the point in the curve uh, where we work most, it, it's it's proven to be more effective. Okay. And I think that's just because we fine tuned that turbo, that whole injector system, that whole, you know, it, it it's all come together really well. So when we look at um. From an equipment perspective or an installation perspective, when we talk about power density, we have to factor in cooling pack size, after treatment size, all that kind of stuff. Um, so if we can presumably get away without any kind of after treatment device, um, we're going to have more power or uh, space efficiency than the diesel. What does the what does the heat rejection look like compared to diesel? The same power node with a with a low temperature combustion, or a, is there a lower overall heat rejection? No, it's you, you, making the same amount yeah, of power. So, we, so. We, yeah, we're, we're pretty much exactly the same. So, okay. so the machines we're running are like for like cooling packs. So there's no, you know, if you look at that backhaul loader on hydrogen, okay. same chassis, same loader arms, same, same engine, well, same engine location uh, mm -hmm. to be able to drop in, same cooling pack. Yeah, and that that's what we like about it. So you can imagine we we foresee being able to build build either a hydrogen version or a diesel version back to back and then as the transition we move across to hydrogen and and so we're designing it so it runs through our production lines same machine and our customers will absolutely love it yeah. for um for parts parts usage parts maintenance especially big rental companies where you're using exactly the same bonnets same cooling packs you've got those parts in your portfolio yep okay um the the installation considerations around using hydrogen um it's a tricky gas. A lot of people, especially in rocketry and those types of areas, uh, always complain about how hard it is to seal and contain and deal with. W what type of considerations do we need to take in terms of installation of looking at location of lines, uh, types of connections we're making, ability to vent the spaces where hydrogen might escape to? Um, the it seems to me that there's probably a, a new range of considerations that we haven't really had to worry too much about before. I mean, if, if you have a leaking diesel fuel hose, you spill some fuel on the ground, right? Mm. It's not a huge issue, but if you have a leaking hydrogen line, you well, could have think, a problem. I think, I think, I mean, that, that's what we used to think. But what, what we've realized, actually, that the liquids falling on the ground are horrendous. You know, For it, sure, it, it, especially it, environmentally, it, yeah. So, so, but also, your fire, your fire hangs around. You know, if, if you have a combustion and it's underneath the machine and it's on the ground, it can flow away. It can I mean, the, the amazing thing we've learned with hydrogen is it it just travels vertically at forty miles an hour. Yeah. So forty miles. An hour. Forty miles an hour. So <laughs> because it's so light, it goes so quickly. Yeah. And it and it really struggles to go laterally. 
So if you have a leak, it just dispenses vertically. And it'll, it'll do, as long as there is, it's a tiny molecule. So as long as you've got any form of ventilation space, it just, it just disappears. So, you know, if we had a leak in here, yeah, it would true. be out and gone before we could even, you know, before we could even, I mean, we use the old cork thing. You know, you, you, you open a, um, you know, a drink, pull a, pull a can, yeah. and it's, it's just gone. So there's no, no particular concern around bonnets or hoods or those types of things that, and, do we need yeah. to add ventilation? I think, I think where, where we designed it, the areas, the areas around the tank areas are open. We will, I think as part of the pressure vessels uh, standards, you, you will have ventilation routes. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but also, no need for like forced induction with electric fans for those no, areas, no. I think. Like, mm -hmm. like you see marine applications, for example. And I mean, the, the, one thing you, the one thing you don't want to do is to, is to box it in. Right. You know, you, you just... Mm -hmm. Um, but what, what we found again, you know, we, we, we've worked on pretty basic diesel tanks for years, um, and we've perfected those, but you move to pressure vessels and they're, they're just in a different world. They really are. They're, they're just the fittings, the quality of the fittings, the standards. Um, it's quite amazing really. And what, what we love about it is that we contain the high pressure within the tank. And then actually the lines go into the engine at a low pressure. Well, it's a, it's a perfect segue for me because I wanted to start talking about the fuel system and the storage. So um, the machines that you've got now, the systems you develop are around three or at 350 bar or about 5,000 PSI storage yep, pressure. Yep. And you're and you're using like a um, carbon over axe pressure vessel yep. for storage. Um, is, is, is that is that 350 bar an accepted pressure limit is that specific to the uk or are there opportunities for other storage pressures yes yeah, well well cars cars run at 700 bar yeah so that's to have a smaller tank um the, the challenge is you have to double the carbon wrap and it's probably not quite double it's probably two and a half times yeah so it becomes very expensive i think if you've got refueling stations down a highway then you can have compressors there and you can compress all the way up to a thousand bar to decant into cars at 700 but actually in our industry what what our customers have been asking for really is is how do we get tube trailers you know the from the hydrogen plant being delivered at say anywhere from 600 to 900 bar so i met with a company for breakfast this morning 930 bar in a tube trailer mm -hmm. so they can decant to cars but for that that's for our industry is fantastic trucks trucks have been looking at 350 bar yeah. Um, and I think it's just more about the need not to compress gas too much. Yeah. We like the 350 bar. Uh, our hydraulics on machines run at 350 bar. So we, we're used to that pressure. Yeah. It's not, um, it's not above. And then of course we, we've got more physical space. So we have got a bit of space. Um, it's maybe not perfect for cylinders today, but as we, as we look at machine designs in the future, we'll start to think how we, how we build those tank designs in. You can start to design around the different types of fuel yes. systems as opposed to having an existing space to drop it into, right? Um, the, in looking through all of the benefits and, uh, and drawbacks of hydrogen, it seems to me that the fuel storage, the amount of energy you can store in, in tanks mm. compared to a liquid diesel fuel is, is really kind of the big difficult issue. Um, the, Someone needs to check my math here, but uh, it seems to me that for an energy equivalency, you know, you're something around 10 to 1 or 11 to 1 for a gallon of diesel to a gallon of hydrogen at 350 bar. Uh, Am I in the neighborhood? Let me let me do the math. <laughs> He'll do the energy. We, 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 we've already have a non-live recording. We can call us at 3 do the man. At 350, we look at around 1 kilogram is 3 liters equivalent. Well, so... so yeah, we do, we, so, so so basically, it is energy. One one kilogram of hydrogen is equivalent to three liters of diesel. Right. Yeah. Um, gallons. Um, and, and one of the challenges that that you have with hydrogen is that is that energy density. Getting enough hydrogen. Uh, Tim well, Tim can say this after me. So they're recording. So, but just just so one one thing is what, and it, it's really interesting because you you've done exactly what I did. You've gone back to compare it to diesel. Yeah. So, so let's assume diesel's banned. So in the future, you can't have diesel because that, that's what's going to happen. So this is the conundrum. So you imagine, we assume we've got no engine, we've got no diesel. So we start this path. So okay, I've got a choice. 
On my machine, I can put batteries. Okay. How, how long, how, so if my backhoe does 10 times a mini excavator, how many batteries do I need on a backhoe? Yeah. So does, now, does it scale very well? So, so now I do the energy comparison of the number of batteries versus the mass yeah. versus, yeah. can I work 24 hours? Can I refuel in seven minutes like I can with a, with a mobile fuel? So we've got that conundrum of, if I want to work 24 hours a day, what's the conversion? So, so we, 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 we just have a simple spreadsheet. So we say a product on batteries. You do do do. Yeah. We, we do the product on batteries. We then do a product on a fuel cell. We do a product on hydrogen. But what you start to realize is, and, and where I keep coming back to is, is you've got the energy of each, but actually, basically, what you're getting into is the tank for each. So for me, electricity is a fuel, and the tank is a battery. Yeah. And it's very expensive, and it and it takes a long time to refuel the battery. Yep. That's the way. Of them. And then we move to fuel cell, and we go through that whole conundrum, but pretty much the fuel cell and the engine. So we were taught big difference in efficiency, and that's not right. So, so we, we, we were taught the fuel cells were up at 60%, but we run a machine, it's high, high 40s. Fuel cell in a bench on its own might be at 60, but by the time you put that into the product and work it, you're really starting to pull it down. So we... We then get to, okay, we need to use hydrogen. So we keep thinking, well, wouldn't it be lovely to have a tank that's a thousand bar, 1500 bar. So therefore we, we can have as much hydrogen on board as we want. But then there's the conundrum. It starts to be like batteries. Well, how much is it going to cost? Yes. So we, if I'm honest, we're still working through that iteration. What, what I love to challenge our engineers on and part of the presentation, the last, the last decade, we've made our machines 50% more fuel efficient. So what we're challenging our engineers is, you know, 350 bar tanks, probably the, the, the easiest to use, the easiest to refill, the fastest to refill. Yeah. Let's keep making that engine super efficient. So I need to use the least amount of hydrogen. Yeah, and, and I, I, think it's, I think it's an unfair expectation for uh, end users, OEMs or customers to, to say, we have to have a solution that fits in the exact same space Mm -hmm. makes the exact same power, costs the exact same, right? It, to yep. be one-to-one -one the same mm -hmm. with a diesel fuel, right? Yeah. Because we have all the advantages of a, a, a zero emission combustion. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think the the trade-off in the durability or duration of a single load of fuel is something that needs to be discussed. And higher, higher pressure storage mm -hmm. or more efficient operation or operators just need to get comfortable with the fact that they may have to refuel more often and build that into their operations, but so so the I mean, version of battery is important there too. It's not a it's not a five hour recharge. No, it's, yeah. it's can be filled in the same length of time as a as a liquid fuel. And that's 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 the so I mean I, I remember that group on a farm used to in the summer used to plow for 12, 14 hours a day. Yeah, and there's, there's a ritual, isn't there? Every morning you fuel your machine, regardless of how much is in the tank. It's refueled every morning all your seven minutes. You know, you check, you check all your filters, you check all your, you do your tire pressures, you do your, all, all those daily checks are done. And then off you go, do your full day shift, and then you come up. Nothing more frustrating than getting three quarters through the day and you've got to come back and get some fuel. So our chairman's always challenged us as business. You've got to have a full day shift, even with the electric. Yeah. So, so again, that's where there's, there's, there's different conundrums. So what, what we're engaged in is we're going to put enough hydrogen on board to do a full day shift. We don't have the luxury of, of putting enough hydrogen on board to do three day shifts. Well, that's, I think a lot of tanks are sized. So what, we, what we're targeting is, is if you feel that up with your daily checks every day, then we're absolutely bang on. And because hydrogen tanks are expensive, we, we could stack them, you yeah. know, but, but actually, do you really want to carry that cost on the machine? You, you don't need to. Yeah. But I think that's part of, a bit of a re-envisioning of the job site that the whole industry is going through yeah. right now. The same challenges with electric. Mm. Do we need charging stations or something that's mobile to move around for electric machines? So I, yeah. it's just a, it's an important piece of re-envisioning what this work looks like with some of these alternate technologies. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I like to think about it as like with your mobile phone. So phones used to last like a week, didn't they? Oh, yeah. Your old Nokia's and that kind of thing. And then when you had smartphones, they wouldn't even last a day. Yeah. And, and I had a, a housemate who used to have to swap his batteries because he used it so many. Now you've got your iPhone, which lasts a day. Yeah. But if you're out on a show like this, yeah. you're taking photos all the time and whatever. You take a battery with you. You, yeah. you have to take a battery and you've got to charge it. And yeah. but the advantage of hydrogen is that 
that you got that quick refuel. Yeah. That if you're a farmer and in the middle of the summer you're doing your harvest, you want to work 22 hours a day. You you might take your fuel to the field and fill up. Otherwise, if you're battery electric, do you need? Do you have two tractors? Do you have three? And then, yeah. Are we what? One of the conundrums that we've gone through, and I guess we when we started, we all thought, well, we should put 700 bar on. So we'll have the smallest tank that will carry the most hydrogen. Yeah. But then you start to realize you, you're introducing too many complexities. So then you, you really work, are working at high pressure. If you need to compress the gas, you, you, it's time consuming. It doesn't necessarily help you decant because we have a very, very high pressure. So I, I think we just feel comfortable at that um, 350 bar. There's a good supply base now because of the truck world. There's a good supply base for that pressure, for regulators of that pressure, for pipes, pipes uh, um, and flanges and, mm. and uh, so it, it, it's coming together fairly well. The, the thing I love doing is challenging to say, you know, if they, if they say, oh, we want to put a couple more tanks on here, mm. let's yeah. just make sure that machine, why don't we make the machine slightly more efficient so we don't need to... I, I think the um, machine side efficiencies are, are also the unsung hero of carbon reduction. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that the easiest way to, to generate less carbon is just need to burn less fuel to get a job done. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think that's a point well taken is that you can, if you, if you have efficiency gains on the machine side, uh, and you can just reduce the amount of fuel you need to get that one day's job done. Yeah, right. And I think that's what a lot of people see, you know, a lot of the things you see here at the, at the site, uh, going back to that, that work control, you know, minimizing waste of over digging, all those great things, mm -hmm. all goes back to minimum carbon. Yeah, yeah, they all kind of align in the same direction. Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, the the JCBs are uh, off road to, to zero. Um, the the hydrogen engine is getting ready for production is that a fair statement i know you have produced yeah yeah we're multiple built. engines for internal use right? so we, we've got over 50 engines built now we're um we're building a, a considerable test fleet um what a, what a, what our customers want to do with this so they want to start an experience in create net zero sites yeah so they want to be able to take them onto sites start to understand how we get hydrogen we had a breakfast meeting this morning with one of our great customers and a hydrogen supplier, three of us together, mm -hmm. starting to work out how it would work. They want to prepare that and start to think, how, how do we make this happen? So there's no point of having a hydrogen combustion engine machine on site without, without any hydrogen. So we, we're tying together, uh, understanding where the hydrogen's being produced, and we'll start to really, but we, we desperately want to get the machines into customers' hands. You know, they're the real experts, work them, and make yeah. sure we've got absolutely everything right. Yeah, so I, I think the, the important difference in what's sitting out here in the booth versus what you see in, in other advertisements or, or show pieces, that these are engines you guys are building and earning equipment today. Yeah. And I think in that respect, you're quite a ways ahead of where everybody else is who might just be starting to think about, hmm, let's build a hydrogen engine. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's, that's probably hard to understate. I don't know how far ahead you think you are, but it seems to me that you might be a year or two ahead of everybody else. Well, I think, I think, I think the good feelings we probably are, but um, I mean, the, the other thing is, it, it's nice to know now that we're not alone. Yeah. You know, our chairman, you know, came out very early and said we, we should really be looking at this technology. You know, that, that some people here haven't had the opportunity to experiment with fuel cells. And they, when they do, they'll be shocked. <laughs> you know, they'll be really shocked at, um, you know, things like, like deionized coolants and things that you could fry your fuel cell if you put water in it. I mean, yeah. nobody told us any of these things. So you come back to it. Um, and, and I think if we had done one thing different at the show, we would have brought one machine round and we would have been driving through the tunnels with the Teslas or something. You know, we would have, we, we would have had it here and demonstrated it yeah. and showed it uh, yeah. in action because seeing is believing in it. It's, um, you know, even when I drove the first machine, so, so we, we put an engine in into a standard machine on a Friday. We, we spent the next few days changing the tanks, putting tanks on it, coupling up, doing the software. Thursday of the following week, 3 p.m., I was driving the machine, and I couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. And, and if it wasn't green and white, it was yellow, and they hadn't told me which machine was which, I would have, I would have, been a, a bit, I would have thought it's a bit odd, there's some steam coming out of the exhaust. 
It's, it's exactly the same. Yeah. And that, that does it sound? It's it's sweet. It's sweeter because it's um, spark injection rather uh, spark ignition rather than um, exploding. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Compression. Uh, you got, we got a bit of turbo noise on the early ones. Yeah. So it's not. It's not race car turbo noise. You know, but but it's a, it's a nice sweet little because of that grunt of air going in. So yeah. and it, I mean it, it'll. It performs like a backhoe, it, it acts like a backhoe, it, it pretty much sounds like a backhoe, it drives like a backhoe, it's pretty much a normal backhoe, yeah. So the, do you, do you suspect that the fuel cell will stay, will stay part of the, the solution in JCB's long-term portfolio? Is, is there ongoing work to refine and improve that solution for, yeah, we, for well, the future? We, we, you know, we, we are technology neutral in our minds. Um, We'll continue with compact electric machines yeah. where, where they're suitable, where, where there is need. Um, the fuel cell for us is just way too complicated, too expensive. Um, now, we, we haven't torn that machine down. We, we will, Mr. Bamford, again, I found out a great expression, simplicate. So we're, we're, we're looking to see how we simplicate, but really the, the world needs to simplicate. We need to, you know, when platinum's $908 an ounce, yeah. You know, a hundred thousand pound fuel cell will tell you how many ounces are in there. Yeah. And it, it's not a lot, but it's very, very expensive. Yeah. And sadly, the people who make fuel cells aren't in control of the price of platinum. Yeah. Um, so they can't cost reduce it on the ways that we would hope. I think we underestimate that the power electronics are, they're not just more difficult, they're, they're incredibly incredibly different and i think you know we're using lithium titanate batteries that are was it 30 30 or thousand pounds for five kilowatt hours or energy batteries will be 20 kilowatts for eight thousand pounds yeah you know they get so hot we put we put water pipes through the middle the batteries have their own cooling pack mm -hmm. it, it's the level of complexity is i mean it took our engineers six weeks to commission the electronics on the fuel cell machine to make it work and it, you, you know, you know, uh, electronics and, and that can be a bit temperamental every now and again. Yeah. You know, we things like, um, you know, whether we drive a, t a hydrogen car or whether we drive a hydrogen digger, we we just experienced all the cold weather. You know, it has to deplete deplete its steam in the evening. It has to clear itself out so it doesn't freeze overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's things that are we're still learning about the complexity. Well, nobody tells you is if you take a mirror into a garage, it does a little wheel floor. Yeah. You get you get a nice puddle yeah. of water because it's got a drain on the table now. Yeah. Well, I, I, I took one home about three weeks ago. I drove it into my garage. I was shutting the doors, and uh, and you can imagine that it started to deplete all the steam out of the fuel cell. So I thought that can't be right. And then uh, I went back a couple of minutes later, and it was still evacuating the because you go in the garage and it's, it's like a sauna. You know, it's a but if there's little things that you don't, people don't tell you, you've got to experience it over time. And I think that can be turned into a benefit or a feature instead of a bug, you know. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just, it's a big one. I think, I think we thought it was a fairly simple change. Yeah. And actually, it, it's a dramatically different change. Are, are there any other, you know, diesel internal combustion, hydrogen internal, internal combustion, full battery electric, fuel cell, Possibly some hybridization of all of those technologies. Are there any other technologies that JCB is looking at for for their their path to zero? Well, we we look at combinations of them all, but but really we 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 we've been through the learning on lots of them, mm -hmm. and um, you know we 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 build what well over four hundred engines a day, probably a few more, and you know we've got a supply chain that's established with today's technology and the knowledge base in the field. The whole the whole the whole fuel cell is um, so the whole engine is really it just works and and it our dealers can service it yeah people are confident you know that even though this is a dramatic breakthrough to a service engineer it's pretty much the same apart from four spark plugs I mean that can you imagine when we open the door on a fuel cell machine and we tell them to work on batteries and you know with a battery you can't you can't fix a battery you send it back again. Yeah. You know, you can't fix a fuel cell, you send it back. Yeah. But but the engine that, that comes to The other thing is our industry relies on resale values for products. Our machines have second, third lives. They go all over the world. You know, they, these machines and this technology can be used anywhere. Yeah. Anywhere and can be serviced by anyone. 
with um, with, with the technology that we do. And I think what we want to do is to re refine it, make it better and better. Um, we have looked at all different fuels, fuel types. So we did look at ammonia. We did look at yeah. HVO. Some of our customers run that. Ammonia was interesting, but um, we didn't realize, you know, how it's the best way to describe it. it, it it's toxic. So, you know, it, it, it's, it attracts itself to water. So eyes, nose, yeah. lungs. You know, you've got, you've got to have a, a proper safe suit on. You know, if you ever, if you ever, you know, we've, we've experienced an engine running on, on an ammonia and the tailpipe stinks. We well, can really. You get that with SCR sometimes too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the little smell. With that constant flow of, I mean, it's, yeah. it's pretty bad. I mean, anybody that's got one in a lab, the exhaust pipe won't be near the lab. They'll have, they have <laughs> ducts that travel away a long way. But that tells you a lot. Yeah, fair enough. Well, Tim, thanks for joining me. That's all the questions Good I have pleasure. for you today. Yep. Yep. Thanks for listening to Ingenuity. We record and release a new episode every month. Be sure to follow us at Ingenuity Podcast on Instagram for updates about future episodes and industry news.